Hello and welcome back. And no, your eyes do not deceive you. I am not at home in Texas. I am all the way up in Wall, New Jersey, attending an event that I hold very near and dear to my heart, VCF East. This is one of the events that I look forward to most throughout the year. So let's head out there, take a look at some of the exhibits, and then we're gonna come back in here to one of my most favorite places and take a look at what's going on behind me. So let's get started. First and foremost, what is VCF? The Vintage Computer Federation assists, organize, and even runs events around the country dedicated to, well, vintage computing. This particular event happens in Wall, New Jersey, and even though it's quite a trek for me, it's worth it. The turnout this year was very impressive, so let's take a look at some of the machines that caught my eye. And first up is DJ Surez, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, they had a nice little Naboo setup going on. DJ and Leo have single-handedly brought the Naboo scene to life, developing all sorts of new ways to keep these quirky little machines relevant and exciting. And talking with DJ, we're maybe even thinking of some interesting things to do with the Naboo that I have that was donated by a friend of mine up in Dallas. Just down the hall from the somewhat sedate looking Naboo was easily the most colorful exhibit of the show. I don't think I've ever seen so many RGB LEDs in one place in my life, but I ain't gonna lie, on camera it looks absolutely stunning. Moving over to the main hall, Ryan Burke had a pretty wild display covering 40 years of Macintosh. There was just about every single variation of Mac on display here, and there was even a powered on and working Lisa on display too. That was very, very cool to see. A good buddy of mine, Nicholas, pulled out some pretty epic luggables for the show. He had an Altair 8800 with paper tape reader, an Osborne executive, and a compact luggable with glorious green CRT on display. It was awesome. And Nick, it was awesome hanging out. Dave Test and Amiga Bill had a pretty wicked Amiga setup this year. This particular Amiga was rocking all sorts of upgrades, including an LED bar graph that dances along to the music of the game being played. I don't personally know much about the Amiga, but man alive, was this one ever a capable machine? Reshoot Proxima 3 here is a new game released just last year for the Amiga, and it looks absolutely stunning and a proper riot to play. Moving around the room, this display of TRS-80 Model 2 boards caught my eye. I'm a sucker for pure dip-based stuff, and the TRS-80 Model 2 has some very cool board designs for sure. One exhibitor that I always look forward to seeing is David Gesswain. This year he brought a nice compact PDP-8 setup connected to a gorgeous VT-105 data terminal, which is interestingly very similar to the venerable VT-100 but includes waveform graphics capabilities. All of this was connected up to a couple of printers creating art for the visitors. Andy Geppert's Core 64 booth was a pleasure to see again. I love core memory, and seeing Andy's genius on display here was just awesome. Andy, if you're watching, one of these days I'm going to corner you and pick your brain because I want to use core on the UE2 vacuum tube computer. I always look forward to what Maki Kato will bring each year, and this year he did not disappoint. This is a Tektronix XD88-10 Unix workstation based on the Motorola 88000 RISC processor. These were wild little graphical workstations that seem like they pack one heck of a punch. The construction of this little powerhouse was fascinating as well, with the boards kind of sandwiched together and folding out like a book. Another stunning display was the genericable setup, run by a host of extremely talented people. They had an entire weather channel system up and running doing weather channel stuff, and there was also some pretty epic cable TV stuff going on too, like this cable box descrambler, so you can get that late night HBO programming for free. John Castorino's exhibit at first looked moderately normal until you peered in a little closer. This particular machine is dubbed the Cordyceps, and yeah, I can totally see it. The Macintosh 2 and Macintosh 2X computers require a math coprocessor in order to boot properly, so he took a PLCC FPU that he had laying around and made the coolest adapter on the planet. He also had a 486 single board computer he was building that had this gorgeous external bus, so John most definitely has a penchant for awesome design. And now we're getting into my top two exhibits of the entire event. 
The runner-up goes to Oscar and Otto with the stunning PyDP setup. The workmanship on these is absolutely out of this world, and they are just stunning to look at. They had the brand new PyDP 10 on display, and it was gorgeous chugging along, plotting astral projections or intense math calculations. Everything from the quality of the lights to the feel of the switches on this thing was top notch. Excellent job, guys. And finally, my best in show was Josh and Walter's jaw-dropping Cosmac Elf exhibit. It actually took me an entire day to finally muscle my way into the exhibit to get footage. They were always mobbed with a huge crowd. That's how good the exhibit was. It was chock full, top to bottom, with just about every variation of the elf you could think of. There were homebrews, modern interpretations, faithful recreations, you name it, it was here. But what is the Cosmac Elf? From 1976 to 1977, Popular Electronics Magazine published a series of articles outlining an RCA 1802-based microcomputer that could be built at home. The 1802 is a unique 8-bit microprocessor and was also the first CMOS microprocessor. The design of the 1802 allowed a homebrew computer to be built using an absolutely minuscule number of parts, and Josh and Walter's exhibit here was a celebration of that. There was so much to take in at the exhibit that I could have spent all day there listening and learning, but they had much more important guests. You see, the brainchild behind the Cosmac Elf was Joseph Weisbecker. And while Weisbecker was deep in hardware design, his daughter Joyce Weisbecker handled the software. And none other than Joyce herself showed up to hang out. What a stunning turn of events. Thank you guys for the awesome exhibit. After taking a look at some of the pretty epic exhibits going on in there, one of my favorite things about having that event here at InfoAge is that you can mosey on out and make your way over to here, which is a amazing little computer museum that I'm afraid not a lot of people at the event actually know is here. It's very close and you can walk right over. So if you're coming here next year, definitely come check out the museum because there is just a ton of epic stuff in here. And, well, I really wanted to set aside some time to hang out here with Douglas Crawford, who runs the museum and is actually a really good friend of mine. So I am going to hand it off to Douglas Crawford here. And Doug, I want you to tell people what this museum is about and what they can kind of expect to find going on in here. All right. Well, in a nutshell, this, this room that you, I think, seen some pieces of uh, was lovingly put together by my predecessors to be an awesome set of exhibits that pick up on the important eras and the important changes in computers from the 40s to the 2000s. And we have focused on making all these exhibits function so you can use them. And then over the last year and a half, we've worked very hard to create an experience in this museum whereby you get to really understand the cultural settings that these computers were used in. We actually even want to give people an appreciation of how the machines work. Okay, so when you say an appreciation of how the machines work, does that mean that you're actually taking stuff apart in here to show them the guts? We like to open doors, take the lids off, uh, show them inside, if not actually have pieces on display, examples of what's in the computers. We'll go so far as to tell them kind of, okay, these are tubes and these are transistors. We'll talk about digital logic a little bit and show them how digital logic works, uh, all depending on what people want to know. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's fun to see the lights go on and people understand what's cursing through these machines, the electrons. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, this is, this is kind of an aside now, but I always get a ton of comments of people saying that I get overly excited when something works. But the truth is, is that I'm not an electrical engineer, and when the electrons do what you want them to do, it's inherently exciting. And I think that's something that Doug is capturing really well in here. And so this museum is an excellent place to experience that. And I don't want to show you guys everything, but I do want to show you some of the special things hiding out in here. So I'm going to walk around and get some pretty epic footage of some of the cool things in here. The museum actually took delivery of a Bendix G15 while I was here visiting, which was extremely exciting. This particular G15 is serial number 93 and has some interesting things going on with it. 
It is a numeric machine like the one I'm currently working on back at home, but it's been modified for, we believe, networking to something through the MagTape port. What a fascinating piece to have on display. This is also one of the first times I've been able to get up close and personal with the MagTape drive. It's a really interesting unit as well. And while we're on the topic of old vacuum tube behemoths, the Philbrick analog computer is a sight to behold. It's a stunning collection of plug boards and adjustment knobs, and all throughout the inside, it's just filled to the brim with K2W op amps. These are awesome little op amp modules in a nice octal package, and I actually copied the design of the K2W to build the comparators in my UE555. But what is an op amp? Well, they're just differential amplifiers with an intense amount of gain. Essentially, you have two inputs, and the op amp amplifies the voltage differential between them. For example, if we have one volt on one input and 1.1 volts on the other input, there's a difference of 0.1 volts. That difference is multiplied by the gain. In the case of the K2W, that's on the order of 15 thousand, which means the output would be 1.5 kilovolts, or really just the rail voltage, which in this case is either plus 300 volts or minus 300 volts. But what makes op amps really powerful is you can build in feedback to change the gain. A little bit of negative feedback and you can set the gain to whatever you want, making it a great little controllable multiplier. There are a ton of different ways to use op amps to do analog math, and the Philbrick computer puts tons of op amps to use to do complex mathematical calculations. Moving up a bit in years, the main party piece at the museum is the Stellar Univac collection. They have a 1219 processing unit, which is the militarized version of the 418, a 1540 magnetic tape storage unit, and a 1532 I.O. unit. It's just this wonderful collection of blinking lights and push buttons. And the really amazing thing is, it works most of the time. Uh, they had it spun up over the weekend and were demonstrating almost all aspects of the machine. The tape drives were spinning away and the Model 35 teletype was hammering out Hunt the Wumpus all weekend. It was awesome. Moving up a few years through history again, and we have this massive IBM 1132 line printer and 2501 punch card reader. Really stellar pieces, but the main piece was actually missing, which is the 1130 computing system. And that was actually out on display at the event. This particular 1130 was on loan to the insanely talented Carl Clanch for restoration. And it was actually up and running during the event. It was being a bit honorary and fighting them every step of the way, but still very, very cool to see. Back in the museum, we're now making strides into the mini computer world with this stunning Wang Model 4000 computer. The design aesthetic is so sleek and clean and really stands out from other minis of the era. The main input output device to the computer is through this little piece here. It's very reminiscent of the Wang calculator that's on display at System Source Museum. And for good reason, the entire logic of that calculator is also present inside this Model 4000. And I said it before and I'll say it again, I absolutely love core memory. It's just so gorgeous. Right behind that core memory, we can see all the diode transistor logic boards that make up the brains of the machine. And right next to the Wang is one of the prettiest minis ever made, the Data General Eclipse Model S140. And my good buddy Ian couldn't help himself, he had to have a seat and give the keyboard a whirl, which is just absolutely killer looking. I would love to get hands on with one of these someday. As we march deeper into the land of TTL logic, this little triad is one of my personal favorites. Triad Minis were a strong competitor against the Centurion, and this particular one happens to have the very same 9427H Hawk Drive. Someday we'll get this Triad up and running fully for sure. As you round the corner, you enter the wonderful world of microcomputers. And if you know me, you know I'm a sucker for homebrews. This particular homebrew was based around the Intersil 6100. That is a PDP-8 on a chip. This was a really interesting homebrew and I'm so glad it was on display. Below that was the trifecta of early home computers, the Altair 8800, 
the Wargames famous MSI 8080, and my personal favorite, an SWTPC 6800 with AC30 cassette interface. Someday I'll get my hands on one of these. I've never owned any Commodore equipment, but if I did, it would have to be a Commodore PET. These things are just so unique looking, and I even like the atrocious keyboard. The beautiful little Commodore calculator is a nice touch as well. At the far end of the room is a machine I initially overlooked at first, but Ian was insistent that I look at it in more detail, and he was absolutely right. The SGI Indigo is an absolute beast of a machine, capable of some insane graphical shenanigans which look about 10 years ahead of its time. You got me Ian, these things are pretty cool. And last, but certainly not least, let's get Tech Time Traveler on the phone because this Soul 20 computer is just stunning. I love these things and it looks great with the Micropolis floppies next to it, but this one in particular is signed by none other than Lee Felsenstein. That is the original developer of the Soul 20. And Felsenstein didn't just develop the Soul 20, he had his hands in all sorts of revolutionary designs, including a plethora of S100 designs, the Penny Whistle modem, and even the Osborne 1. It was really cool to see this piece proudly on display here at the museum. Now I showed you a ton of beautiful machines in this absolutely epic museum, but there is one machine that I skipped over and actually it's because it's one of my favorite machines and I wanted to save it to the end and it's this it's the Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-8 lovingly referred to as the straight eight now I have no idea why it's called the straight eight uh, whenever I hear that I think of old Lincolns and Buicks that have the straight eight engine in them so actually you know what if you know why it's called the straight eight leave a comment below I am really curious but this is a gorgeous piece of equipment and one of the reasons that I absolutely love it is because it has wood grain. More things in our life need wood grain, but this thing has a really interesting construction. And this, I would venture a guess to say, absolutely cemented the idea of computers being mini, hence the name mini computer, because it's absolutely minuscule. It's like a quarter of the size of the Data 620, which came out in the same year as this. This is, like the Data 620, a purely DTL machine, and it's built out of these things called flip chips. So I've got one right here, and you can actually see the little transistors and I'm guessing germanium diodes uh, along the bottom here. And you just plug a bunch of these into a backplane and create your complex logic that way. But there is one really big reason why this is my favorite machine in the entire room, and that's because uh, they gave me the keys to this one. So, <laughs> I'm also, that's something that we need more of. Computers need keys. That's just really cool. But let's take this key, plug it in here, crank it on, and see if we can get a program running. All right, the PDP-8 is a very interesting system to try and write code for. I only started learning PDP-8 assembly about six hours ago, so I'm still very much so new at this. The first three bits here would be the opcode, so you only have eight operations. The uh, fourth bit here is going to be whether we're doing direct or indirect operations. The fifth bit here is uh, zeros. I don't know, this has something to do with memory and which page of memory you're on. Uh, and then the final bits all the way to the end here are memory address. But the program that I want to run today is really very simple. Now everything is in octal, which is a nightmare. I'm still trying to get used to that. But uh, let's go to address 17 here. So we got zero, zero, then we'll do one, seven, and we will load that address here. There is absolutely nothing at that place. So let's put something there. We're gonna put 7,000. Uh, so seven, zero, zero, zero. This is a no operation. We're just depositing that into there. Look at that. We deposited our first instruction, yay. Now let's actually write a program. The program counter automatically incremented, so you can see we're up to 0020 now. And uh, the next instruction that I wanna input is a 7001. This is an increment accumulator instruction. The PDP-8 has precious few registers, but the accumulator is one of them. So a 7001 instruction will increment the value in the accumulator by one. So let's deposit that instruction. The uh, program counter, you can see, incremented by one. So now we're on address 0021. The instruction that we wanna do here is 2034. So I'll just toggle that in right quick, 2034. 
three and four here. Uh, and we will deposit that and we see two, zero, three, four here. This is an increment instruction, but we're actually incrementing the value stored at address two, four. Whatever value is at that address will just get incremented by one. Now again, the uh, program counter incremented on its own. It does that auto increment for us. So we're at zero, zero, two, two now. Uh, the instruction that we want to put here is a five, zero, two, one. So five, zero, two, one is going to be a jump instruction. Uh, this is going to jump to address two, one. So we're at uh, address two, two now. So we're jumping back to the previous instruction that we just programmed in. So all we're doing is creating a very tight loop here. Now, the interesting part about the instruction 2034 that we did at address 21 is that, yes, it does increment the value at address 24, but if that value is zero, it skips the next instruction. So this is how we're getting out of that tight loop that we wrote. And all this tight loop is doing is burning time so that we can see whatever result we're trying to get to. And uh, before I forget, we need to uh, deposit that in there. We auto increment to 0023. This is gonna be our final instruction. We're gonna do a 5020. This is another jump instruction and it's jumping to address 0020, which is what we had all the way at the beginning, which was an increment accumulator instruction. So all we're doing is incrementing the value in the accumulator here by one but we put a tight little loop in there to slow it down so that we could actually see the increment happen. So I have no idea if this is actually gonna work. Uh, I did test this earlier, but I'm not good at this. So who knows? We'll go back to 0020. We will load that address uh, and then we will hit start. Uh, helps if you push the single step and single instruction switches down here. So let's load that address one more time and we'll hit start again. And it didn't work. So, uh, I have no idea if this is going to work, but we'll go back to 0020. That's where our program starts. We'll hit load address and start. There it goes. <laughs> yes, finally. Thank God. That was so tough. <laughs> My brain can't handle it. But you can see the accumulator is incrementing exactly how we want it to. It is uh, interestingly over here showing what instructions are being used. You can see that we have ISZ kind of lightly illuminated and JMP lightly illuminated. So those are pretty much the only instructions that we were using throughout our very tight program there. By the way, this seems to be working excellently. That is awesome. Anytime you're toggling a program into a PDP-8 with the toggle switches, it's a good day. But this machine is capable of so much more and I'm not smart enough to write a proper program. And once the program gets really long, Punching it in with the toggle switches is just gonna take forever. So I've got somebody really special. I've got Thomas here to help us out. So Thomas, tell the people what it is that you do here. Well, I'm uh, the Vintage Computer Federation's warehouse and artifact manager. I'm in charge of our collections management, our restorations of all our systems, maintaining them, keeping them running, which is a constant effort around here. <laughs> yeah, that one's been fighting us all day. Oh, yeah. uh, all right, so what are, you gonna, what are you gonna load in? Well, I'm going to uh, demonstrate a little program that we use pretty much day to day here in our museum. Uh, it's going to interpret whatever we type in on that teletype right there, read in the ASCII, and on our tape punch there, it's gonna print out nice big block letters that typically we hand to our visitors as little souvenirs they can take home. Well, we're gonna load up our read in mode program here, or rim loader for short, and we ha keep that generally at location seven, 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 keep it easy. Uh, that's not the actual beginning of the program, it just jumps to it, but nice and convenient. Stop, load address, and start. And now we're in our rim loader. So we're going to move over to our paper tape and actually get that program in memory. All right, got our program. Just lift up our cover, let that fall on the ground, and we're going to set that down so it catches right in our teeth here. Close that, set the start, and now we're ready to go. All right, now that Thomas has done the hard work, I've uh, wrested control back from him because I have to do this. If this works like we think it's gonna work, when I press the letter H, 
Yeah, we get something on bonkers going on over there. Let's hit E next. And you can see H just starting to peek out here. We'll do L, L, O, R, L, D, exclamation point, return. And if we pull that out the top here, there we go. Holoreld printed out on paper tape. That is just about the most epic way we could have printed Holoreld. So there you have it. One of my absolutely favorite places in the whole country. If you ever get a chance to come up to VCF East in New Jersey, I highly recommend it. But you don't have to wait until that specific event to come see this epic museum because they're open pretty much year round. So Doug, I wanna thank you so much for having me out here. I'm gonna shake your hand. Say thank you to everybody out there in YouTube land. Thank you, come see us Monday, Saturday, and Sundays. Wednesday, Saturday, and Sundays. Yes, and I wanna thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.